Okay, so good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the globe. I welcome you to today's session in the WIDS Trinidad and Tobago virtual workshop series. And this is our second workshop in the series. I am Dr. Leticia Addison. I am one of your WIDS Trinidad and Tobago ambassadors. And today we have a really exciting interactive workshop planned for you. So without further ado, let's jump straight in. I will share my screen. Okay, just making sure everybody's seeing my screen, right? Yes? Okay, so today's workshop is entitled Data Science Tools, Where Do We Start? And of course, for those of you who would have probably been with us last week, this is actually a bit of a continuation into some of the tools we could use in the data challenge. And of course, even if you're not in the data challenge, beyond the data challenge, we are going to support you in wherever you are in your data science journey. So our speaker today is Ms. Malini Rambaran, and I will give you a little bit of an introduction to her in a short while. But first, for any of you who are joining us for the first time, just to give you a background of WIDS, WIDS is the Women in Data Science organization, and there is a global organization, a worldwide organization, which seeks to elevate women in data science globally. And we try to celebrate, inspire, educate, and support through extensive programming of course, both regionally and internationally, as you can see through conferences, the Datathon Challenge, which some of you may be aware of, the podcast series, there's also a Next Generation series for high school students, and of course, various upskill monthly workshops, both virtually and in person, depending on where ambassadors are lodged around the world. Now, in terms of the actual data challenge, where I know some of you are already joined to compete within the challenge. This takes place both in January to March and also April to June. There are two legs of it. So we are currently in the first leg of the Datathon. So any of you who are interested in signing up, feel free to jump in to the worldwide page. As you could see at the link at the top here, and you could get more information about the Datathon itself. And of course, if you do not want to enter the first session of the data on the first leg of the data on feel free to enter the second leg of it from April to June. Now, in terms of our workshops and regional events, we are hosting, as you met, um, heard me mention before, a virtual series of events. For those of you here in Trinidad, of course, at the University of the West Indies, we also have a couple in-person workshops for staff and students, but for virtual purposes, for global purposes, here is a list of our workshops that we are hosting every Saturday from 1 p.m. AST. And if you'd like to jump into the other sessions that are coming up, you can feel free to visit our website at widsttt.org for more information on these events. So now I'm going to launch a short poll as a, a little bit of an icebreaker. Now I know every session we have different groups of people. So some of you may have answered a similar poll last week. But in each session, we want to get an idea of what the background is for the persons who are within the room. So I'm going to launch this poll and we will have you enter your data science background for us. So I'm giving you a few minutes to do that. And of course, feel free to look into the chat for any of our websites if you want to look for the challenge, registering for the challenge, et cetera, right? So we give you all a couple of minutes again, I'm seeing the answers, right? And then I will share the results. So, so far we have about 55, I think 52%, 55 is going up, of course, and intermediate. We have about 36% beginners, 9% of you are advanced. Right. Okay. So let's, I'm going to end the poll now and I'm going to share the results with you. Are you seeing the results on the screen? Yes. 
Okay, great. So now you could see we did a little bit of a, our own data science um, poll in there. So we could have a, an idea of how the temperature, I would like to call it, of the room is. So let's get back to our session for today. And I would like to introduce to you our speaker. So Ms. Malini Rambaran, she is a WIDS Trinidad and Tobago mentor for the 2024 Datathon. She's also a web developer at FX and a data scientist at TT Lab. So I'm going to invite Malini now to give us a little bit of her background. I will stop sharing my screen and then she can jump right into her talk. So Malini, feel free to take the floor. Okay, thank you, Dr. Allison. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second workshop. Are you all hearing me? Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. Great. So I'm a developer at WebFX, where my role is to build websites, and I have dabbled in building applications as well. We use some data analyst tools such as Google Analytics and Tag Manager. And with the use of the user's permission, we use these tags to help us understand our users so we can optimize and improve user experience. Also, I'm currently a data science student completing my master's at the University of the West Indies. This is where I got the opportunity to work with TT Lab and the life science department to develop a classification algorithm to automatically detect the genius and species of plankton from images collected within the Caribbean region. So I'm going to share my presentation. And we are going to get started. So today we'll be discussing data science too. You may have access to data set and you would like to do some type of analysis to see trends or make decisions. So you may ask yourself the question, how do I start? In today's agenda, we will be discussing what data types are and then the different tools like Microsoft Excel, Google Sheets, MATLAB, IBM SPSS, R, and Python. There will also be a demonstration on the basic use of these certain tools and how to apply a few basic functions. By the end of this workshop, participants will be able to understand the fundamental of various data science tools, compare the disadvantages and advantages of each tool, and how to apply selected data science tools to analyze a health-related data set. So let's get started. So the first thing we will be discussing is data types. To make the most use of your data, the first step will know what type of data is present in your data set. Data can be divided into two groups, which are qualitative and quantitative data. Qualitative data is also known as categorical data because you can label a group of items or data points to a certain category. So an example of this is letter grades or hair color. So qualitative data is divided into two subgroups and they are ordinal and nominal data. Ordinal data follows a certain order or rank, such as letter grades or economic status. Then we will have nominal data. That doesn't follow a certain order, example, hair color, city, or employment status. So the other data type is numerical data. And this is where we can apply mathematical mathematical operations, for example, height or a number of women in a group. Quantitative data can be continuous or discrete. Continuous data can be further divided into smaller units, such as height can be divided into feet, inches, and centimeters. Then you have discrete data that cannot be divided into smaller groups. An example of that is a group of women in a class. You cannot possibly divide someone in half or a smaller unit. So 
So here we have an activity. So you can unmute your mic or comment in the chat which of these items at the bottom of the slide belong to which group. So anybody? So speed of cars will be continuous. The speed of cars, yes. It will be continuous, that is correct. Anybody would like to guess which one for a second and two will fall into which category? Original data ordered. Ordinal data, yes, that's correct. So we have the number of students in a classroom. So we have someone in the chat. And yes, that is correct. Yes, and then we have someone said um, the number of students is discrete. Yes, that's correct. And the last one, nationality, is nominal. So we will just move on now to the next slide. And well, here it shows the order. So now we will move on to data science tools. So data science tools aid in collecting, analyzing, interpreting, and visualizing data. These tools are used to extract insights and help us make informed decisions. So some commonly used data science tools are Microsoft Excel, Google Sheets, MATLAB, IBM, SPSS, Python, and R. So first we will be looking at Microsoft Excel. So Microsoft Excel is a great starting point for learning basic data manipulation and analyzing. It is a user-friendly platform that allows you to efficiently organize and interpret data set to, to derive meaningful insights and inform strategic decision making. So next we will be looking at the advantages of Microsoft Excel. So Microsoft Excel has a familiar and user-friendly interface, making it accessible to individuals with varying levels of technical expertise. It also allows for quick exploration of data through sorting, filtering, and simple charting, making it suitable for initial data analysis. It offers a wide range of built-in formulas, functions for basic calculations and statistical analysis making it easy to perform common data manipulations. It also provides basic charting and graphing tools that are significant for creating simple visualization, aiding in data interpretation and communication. There are also pivot tables that are powerful for summarizing and analyzing large data sets in a flexible and dynamic way, allowing users to quickly derive insights. This can also seamlessly integrate with other Microsoft Office tools such as Word and PowerPoint, facilitating the creation of comprehensive reports and presentations. Microsoft Excel is also widely used in business environments and many professionals are already familiar with it, making it a convenient choice for collaboration for data analysis in certain settings. But we also have some disadvantages of Excel. It may struggle with large data sets, leading to performance issues and limitations in terms of data storage and processing. While suitable for basic statistical analysis, Excel may fall short when it comes to advanced statistical methods or complex data modeling. It is not designed for building and deploying machine learning models. Collab collaboration in Excel can be challenging when it comes to vision control 
and tracking changes, especially in large teams or projects. Also to use Microsoft Excel, it requires a license. Although Excel supports some automation through macros, it may lack the level of automation like other tools. It heavily replies on manual input, which can introduce errors and making it challenging to maintain data integrity in complex analysis. While Microsoft Excel provides basic tools for data cleaning, more advanced data cleaning and pre-processing tasks often require dedicated tools or programming languages. So can anyone guess how many rows and columns are in Excel? You can unmute your mic or just comment in the chat. Okay, so we have someone making a guess, nearly 1 million rules. You're very close. Yes, over 1 million. It's over 1 million. So let's see here in the other slide. So from Excel divisions from 2007 onwards, there are exactly 1,048,576 rules and 16,384 columns. So that's quite a bit. So next we would be looking at Google Sheets. So Google Sheets is an online spreadsheet application that provides an intuitive interface and collaborative features, making it an ideal tool for diving into data-related tasks without the need for complex software. Google Sheets offers a convenient platform for data manipulation, analysis, and visualization. So here we're going to discuss some of the advantages of Google Sheets. There's a seamless collaboration with team members in real time. Data is easily imported from various sources including CSV files, Excel, and Google Drive. You can export your analysis to share insights and integrate with other tools seamlessly. Add-ons can extend the functionality of Google Sheets and provide additional tools for statistical analysis, machine learning, and more. It seamlessly integrates with other Google Workspace applications such as Google Docs, Google Slides for a more comprehensive data analysis and reporting experience. With Google Sheets, you can benefit from cloud-based storage, ensuring that your data is accessible from anywhere with an internet connection. You can leverage a wide range of built-in functions and formulas for basic to advanced calculations. So while this may be the advantages we have some disadvantages as well. Google Sheets may struggle with large data set. It has limitations on the amount of data it can handle and performance may degrade with extensive data set. It lacks the more advanced statistical analysis capabilities available in other tools. Complex analysis may be challenging to perform. Google Sheets has scripting capabilities through Google Apps Script, but it is not as powerful or flexible as other tools. Integrating machine learning models or performing advanced machine learning tasks is not practical within Google Sheets. Google Sheets is a cloud-based tool, which means it depends on an internet connection. So while Google Sheets can be used offline for basic tasks, some advanced tasks or features add-ons and integrations may not be available without an internet connection. Storing sensitive or confidential data in a cloud-based service like Google Sheets can raise security and privacy concerns. So far, we can see Microsoft Excel and Google Sheets 
are more for data cleaning and visualization, not so much for machine learning. So here, I would just do a quick demo on Google Sheets. So first, we have our CSV file that we would have gotten in the university data set that we would be using. So this is how it looks. It's a comma separated file, and you can see everything is pretty much together and separated by commas. So if you upload it on Google Sheets, this is how it would look. It would go into the columns and the first row, it will tell you the name of the columns. So if we want to look at, let's say, the different categories for payer type, what we can do, we can add filters. So I would click data, but before that, I would want to add filters to all the columns. So I would just, on my keyboard, press control and all, then I would go to data, click on create a filter. It will create a filter for all of the columns. So instead of doing it one by one, you can just do it for all. So here, if we click on the filters and thumb filter symbol next to pay a type, we could see a few things. So here you could see the categories in this column. You could see there's blanks, there is commercial, medical, and Medicare Advantage. So if you want to see um, which rows are blank, you can also do a filter by condition. And you can say you want to see the rows that are empty or not empty. So let's see the rows that is empty. And then we will click OK. So at the bottom corner here, we would actually see the number of rows that are empty. So I will just quickly undo that filter. Just remove the filter. And next, we could also look at um, the BMI values as well. So I will just click Control All and create a filter. And here you could see it's continuous values, but they are blanks as well. So according to how much data is missing is how you would fill in the blanks. So it's either if it is a few data is missing, you could remove the rules. But if a lot of data is missing, you might want to find the mean, the median, or the mode or you could also fill forward or backward. So basically, fill forward or backward is what you're doing. It's seeing that this here is empty. You could either bring this value over here or this value over here. Of course, concerning to data, what type of data you have, you have to choose the best method. So if you want to just do a quick chart, you could simply click on top of the column and then go to data. Sorry, insert, then click chart. And over here, we would see a few customization that we could do. So if you want to aggregate the data. So here it shows you how much commercial Medicare Advantage, or just Medicare. But this too might be the same, mean the same thing. So you could actually probably merge these two together. Also, you realize there is a random title here. So we want to use the first row as a header. So we have a better chart showing here. So this is just some of the basic analyzation you could do to just have a feel of your data. So I will now head back to the presentation.
So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at MATLAB. So MATLAB is a powerful environment and programming language. MATLAB is a programming language for doing numerical computation. It was originally designed for solving linear algebra type problems using matrices. Its name is defined from Matrix Laboratory. MATLAB is a paid software, but for the purpose of the Women in Data, data Science Dataton, they are providing you with access to the software. So to access the software, you could follow the link at the bottom of the slide, and you will be able to get the software. So we're just looking at some advantages of MATLAB. MATLAB offers a vast array of built-in functions and toolbox designed for mathematical computations, linear algebra statistics, optimization, and single processing. This extensive collection can streamline complex calculations and data analysis tasks. MATLAB syntax is user-friendly and relatively easy to learn. MATLAB provides powerful visualization tools for creating high-quality plots, graphs, and visualized representation of data. Its plotting functions allow for easy customization and creation of publication-ready figures. MATLAB offers numerous toolboxes catering to various domains such as image processing, machine learning, control systems, and more. MATLAB can easily integrate other languages and technologies. It supports languages like Python, Java, C, C++, allowing users to leverage MATLAB strengths alongside other tools if needed. MATLAB compiler enables the creation of standalone application and sharing of MATLAB-based programs with others who do not have MATLAB installed, providing an avenue for broader development. So MATLAB does have some disadvantages as well. One of those disadvantages is that it could be relatively expensive especially for individuals or small scale use. It has to be a licensed software that you have to use. MATLAB community, while significant, might not be as vast as other open source alternatives. The choice of tools often depends on the requirements of a project or the industry. MATLAB excels in certain mathematical and engineering applications. Other tools might be more suitable for different types of data analysis tasks. In some cases, MATLAB performance may be a concern, especially when dealing with computational intensive tasks. Optimizing performance might require additional effort. MATLAB has a steep learning curve compared to other data science tools. The language and environment may not be as intuitive for beginners, especially those with limited programming experience. So here we're just going to do a quick overview of MATLAB. So I have mine open already and I run everything. So if you open MATLAB, you can click home here. And if you choose, you can choose a new script or what you can do, the script that we had linked in the resources, you can click open and you will be able to open that script and upload it here. So these are just some basics of using MATLAB. So in MATLAB, the editor is where you will write and edit your code. So the editor is this here. And then to save the editor file, what you can do is click save and you will be saving it with the .m extension. So you will see editor on the top here, you click that, and then you can click save. So I will click save as, so you can see the save as the .m extension that's here. 
and you save it with that extension and that can be shared among your pairs. So the command line will display the output of the code written in the editor file, as well as all the errors and warnings will appear in your command line. So this here at the bottom in the middle is our command line. So single line comments start with a percent sign and then your comment will continue for just that one line. So multiple line comments start with a percent and then a curly bracket or open curly bracket and ends with a percent sign and a close curly bracket. To run your script in MATLAB, you could either click the run at the top here or you could click control and enter. So this data that we're using to show the basics of MATLAB is the University Edition data set, the 2024 one. And basically what your task is to is to predict the treatment period for each row given the characteristic of the patient treatment and related social and economic predictors. A more descriptive view of the data set is linked in the resources folder that would have been shared with you. So first of all, we're going to cover what is a variable. So a variable is a symbolic name associated with a value or a data object stored in memory. Variables in MATLAB can present scalar values, arrays, matrices, structures, or other data types. So some best practices for naming variables in MATLAB are to use descriptive names and avoid single letter names except for loop counters. Begin variables with a letter followed by other letters, digits, or underscores. So you would want to use underscores to separate your words just for readability. Avoid using names that conflict with built-in MATLAB function, variable, or toolbox function, such as for or if. Choose concise names that are easy to type and understand by remaining clear. And Obviously, you will want to add comments or documentation to explain concept, complex variable purposes, content, and usage. Also, it's a good reminder for you what the code does. So the first step here, what the script will show you, is that I'm saving the number 10 in the variable x. So here in my command window, I would have run that and then I would have run X by itself. And then it would show me that X is equal to 10. Now you also have your workspace on the right here. So when I run that command, it will show me that X is 10. So sometimes when you set up MATLAB, you may set it up in the other directory, but you may have your files stored in the other directory. So when I would have set up mine, my directory would have been um, documents, but I wanted to save it to my desktop. So you would also see there's a code that you can use to change a directory. But also MATLAB has this easy way of doing it. You just click browse for folder here and you will be able to browse to reach that folder and that will be your working directory. So in MATLAB, it primarily uses functions and toolboxes. So what functions are is that in MATLAB, it has a vast collection of built-in functions that cover a wide range of mathematical and statistical signal processing or other computation tasks. These functions are available by default and can be directly called within MATLAB scripts or from, or from the command line. What toolboxes do is that in MATLAB, it extends its functionality through toolboxes, which are collections of specialized functions, algorithms, and interactive tools designed for certain domains or applications. For example, MATLAB offers toolboxes for signal processing, image processing, optimization, control systems, and more. Users can purchase license the additional toolboxes that enhance MATLAB capabilities according to their needs. So 
you can see my path is set here and it leads to my train CSV file. So what I would want to do now is to load my CSV file. So here's a command to load that train CSV file in the variable train data. So here's my command line, you would see that command. Then to read it, you would see that I ran tra train data. So what train the data does is that it just shows me a little snippet of the data that I have exported, imported. Also in the workspace, you will see train data here. And you would also see the number of rows and columns. So what I can do, I can just click here and I will just expand it here. And you would see it's a very nice format in the table. And from just looking at this, you can see we have a lot of blank data. Now, if it is that a column has like a lot, a lot of blank data or missing values, you can just remove those columns. As well as we can see, yeah, in this column BMI, we have NAN, which is missing values as well. So I will just head back to my editor. And this year was just some code for the number of rows and columns. Even though we see it in our workspace, you can have it appear in your command window as well. And we can see when that command is run that it prints out here. So data types. So in MATLAB, you would see for this data set that you have double that represents decimal numbers or whole numbers as well. Then you have character vector is a one dimensional array of characters or string. In MATLAB, it can represent text data such as words, sentences or individual characters. So what I'm going to do is that I run summary train data. So if you have a look at the command window here, you can see the data type is double. And then you would see you have min, median, and max. And also you will have the number of missing values. So min is obviously the smallest value. Median is the middle value of a sorted data set, and max is the highest value. Num missing represents the number of missing values in each for the, each variable or column of the table. So if we scroll on a bit more, we can see the amount of missing values. So this one actually has a lot of missing values. So this comes to the end of our demonstration for MATLAB. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so now we would just head back to our presentation. And then next we will be looking at IBM SPSS. So IBM SPSS is a comprehensive and will widely used software suited and designed for statistical analysis, data management, and predictive modeling. Originally, it's developed for social science research. It has evolved to become a versatile tool utilized across various disciplines, including data science. So now we would look at some advantages of SPSS. It is a software with a rich library of statistical procedures. SPSS enable users to conduct a wide array of analysis from basic description statistics to advanced tests. The software supports various machine learning algorithms for classification, regression, and clustering. Users can build productive models without extensive programming knowledge. For users comfortable with syntax and scripting, SPSS allows for advanced customization through its command syntax. 
This feature is valuable for automating analysis. SPSS, SPSS supports collaboration through its output files, allowing users to share analysis and results with others. The software also provides features for creating comprehensive reports with text tables and graphics. It also includes decision tree algorithms for exploring complex relationships within data. Model evaluation tools help users assess the performance and accuracy of predictive models. IBM, the company behind SPSS, consistently invests in research and development, ensuring that it stays at the forefront of advancement in data science analytics. So now some disadvantages of IBM SPSS is while it has a user-friendly interface for basic statistical analysis, utilizing advanced features or customizing it through syntax can be challenging, requiring a steeper learning curve. It is a commercial software acquiring license that can be relatively expensive. It is primarily designed for Windows and while other versions for Mac and Linux exist, they may not be, they may not have the full features. It lacks the extensive open source community support like other data science tools. This can limit the availability of free resources, tutorials, and common driven development. While SPSS provides tool for data cleaning and transformation, it offers less flexibility compared to programming languages like Python or R. While users can create custom scripts for certain data manipulation tasks, the development cycle tends to be slower compared to other open source tools which are frequently updated with new features and improvements. Next, we will be looking at Python. So Python has emerged as a powerhouse in the field of data science, offering a versatile and comprehensive ecosystem of libraries and tools. Python, a general purpose programming language, has become a dominant force in the realm of data science. It is known for its readability, flexibility, and a thriving community. Python provides a robust foundation performing a wide range of data-related tasks. Some popular choices for external integrated development environments can include Visual Studio Code, Jupyter Notebooks, and Google Collab. These are all free. So some advantages of Python is that it boosts a, re a rich ecosystem of library libraries that is tailored for data science. It has some libraries such as Panda and Matplotlib that are the backbone of data manipulation analysis and visualization. It is the forefront of deep learning thanks to TensorFlow and PyTorch. These frameworks enable the creation and training of neutral networks for advanced machine learning algorithms. It is an open source software that fosters community-driven development. A vast community of contributors continually enhancing libraries and tools this ensures that Python stays at the cutting edge of data science. Its popularity has led to a wealth of online resources, tutorials, and documentation. Whether you're just a beginner or an expert, you will find abundant support as you navigate your Python data science analysis. Python seamlessly integrates with big data technology such as Apache Spark and Hadoop. 
while allowing users to scale their data science workflow to handle massive data sets. Python is widely accepted in the industry from startups to large enterprises, making it a valuable skill for professionals entering the field of data science. Here we would look at some disadvantages of Python. One significant disadvantage of Python is its memory consumption. Python dynamic nature means it consumes more memory than other languages, which can be an issue when dealing with large data sets or applications where memory efficiency is crucial. Since Python code is not compiled beforehand, some errors only become apparent during execution. This feature can lead to longer debugging times compared to other languages. The speed of Python is another area where it falls behind other languages. Python's execution speed can be slower compared to other languages like C or Java. This slow execution can be a limiting factor for applications that require real-time responsive or high performance. So now we are just going to do a demo on Python. I, am, I believe Dr. Allison will submit the link to the Google Collab and as well as it's linked in the resources. So this here is Google Collab. I can probably make this a bit bigger. Okay, so Google Collab, it's open, free source, it is online, so it's shareable. Multiple people can work on it at the same time. So Google Collab allows you to write, run, and share Python code in your browser. It requires zero configuration, free access to powerful GPUs, and easy sharing. So some basics in Google Collab. So Google Collab Notebook consists of cells that contain either text or code. So you can add a new cell by clicking plus code or plus text button at the top, or you can hover in between cells to see these options. So right here you have code, text, or if I just go in between, I would see that it appears. So your text cell, so this here is a text cell. So if I double click on it, I would see an editor. And then basically if I just double click here, the editor disappears and it shows the text. So this could be used to add explanation, documentation, or comments to your code. Code cells are using for writing and executing Python code. So to execute your code, basically what you can do is on the side here, you just click on this play button and it executes. So here, and we can see that we want to print hello world. So what you do, you type print, that is the function, and in between the brackets, you type hello world. And it appears at the bottom here. Also, you can just use shift and enter, and it will run. So Google Collab automatically saves your notebook to your Google Drive. However, you can click file at the top here and then choose save to force a manual save. So in Google Collab, we have libraries and dependency. So Google Collab comes with many popular Python libraries pre-installed such as Num NumPy, Seaborn, Pandas. However, if you need additional libraries, you could install them using the import command. So at the bottom here, we would see that I would have used some import commands. So these were pre-installed, but what I wanted to do was save them as aliases. 
So basically, these libraries are important for various tasks related to data manipulation, visualization, machine learning, model building, and pre-processing. They provide the essential tools and the functionality to streamline data analysis and machine learning workflow. So as I said, these libraries can be given illnesses, which makes it easy to access functions and methods. So what I'm basically doing here is that I'm saving the Python library as PD. So throughout my notebook, I'll be referencing this library as PD. And as mentioned before, you have variables. So variables is a symbolic name that represents a stored value in the computer's memory. It allows you to store and manipulate data in the program. So some naming conventions in Python is that you it can consist of letters, both upper and lower, numbers and underscores. It must start with a letter, either uppercase or lowercase, but I prefer lowercase. Variable names are case sensitive. So here you have two different versions of my var. You can see that the M is common first and then it's capital in the other one. So that means it's different. And Variables cannot be the same name as Python keywords or reserved words. So some example of these are if, for, def. And some best practices is to use descriptive names to reflect the purpose or content of the variable. You can use lowercase letters for variable names to improve readability and consistency. You can also use underscores to separate words and variable names to improve readability. And we have an example here, snake case. So here we have, we want to store five in a variable X. And to read that value of X, we just run X by itself. And we can see here that five is stored in X. So this script is pre-run, but you can go ahead and run it if you're having any issues you can let us know by commenting in the chat or just putting on your mic and letting us know. So as well as not only numbers, but you can also store strings or text. So what I wanted to store was John, and you can see it's in quotation marks. And then I read it with just running name, and you can see John was saved the name. So we'll be using the same data set throughout this workshop which is the University Edition 2024 dataset. So here I would just have a short description. If you choose to store your data in your Google Drive, you could also refer back to workshop one where they actually take you through storing that file in your drive and mounting it to be processed in your Google Collab. But I prefer having my file on my desktop. So you could upload your files from your local system to the current directory into your Google Cloud environment. But the file that we will be using, because there's a train file and there's a task file, so we'll be using the train file first. And the data set in this file is used to train the model parameters to adjust the initial settings to make accurate predictions. During this phase, the model learns from patterns and relationships presented in the data. So if you have your file stored on your desktop and you want to import it, you can use this command here. Now, when you run this command, you will see choose file. So you simply click choose file and you would see that you can go to your desktop if you have it saved on downloads or documents. And you could choose the file and click OK, and it imports. It also tells you the percentage. Depending on how much data is in the file, it might take a long time. So it comes in handy. So now that I have uploaded my file, I want to load my data set into a data frame. Data frames are used to store and manipulate tabular data. 
It is a two-dimensional structure with data is organized in rows and columns. So for this here, I would like train data to be the name of my data frame that will store my data that is in my CSV file. So the name of my variable is here and PD that what I mentioned earlier on is the pandas library. And what I'm doing, I'm going to use breed CSV. So if you hover over it, it does tell you, give you a little bit of description as to what it is, which is very helpful, especially for beginners. And then in here in the brackets, I have the name of my file. So I want to make sure my data is imported correctly. So I just want to have a glimpse of the few rows in my data frame. And to do that, I would use the print function. I will pass my data frame dot head. And once I run this code, I will see my data set appear. So this just basically basically gives you like the first five lines of your data set. Now, just looking at this here, it doesn't show you all because you can see it's just five rows and 83 columns, but this definitely is not 83 columns. You can see these dots here is where they just left out some. But I can see here BMI that we have saw earlier on has some missing values. And then you can also see which of these columns are numeric, um, which has characters in them. So this definitely doesn't tell you how many rules. It just tells you five rules. But sometimes in the data set, in the description, they will tell you how much rules are in the data set. And to make sure all is imported, we can run this command here, which is print train data dot shape. And here we can see how many rows and columns. So this here is imported correctly. So now we will move on to data types. So in Python, we have numeric. So numeric can be integers, which are positive and negative whole values. Then we have floating point numbers that are positive or negative whole numbers with a decimal point, meaning they can represent fractions of numbers. Then you have objects. This can vary in type. It can either be string or string and integer in a mix. So before we would have just seen a little preview of our data, but what we could do is we could see how many non-null values are in our columns and the data types. So to do that, we just use the info function method in pandas that is used to print a concise summary of the data type, including information about data types, non-null values, and the memory usage. So here we can see patient ID is an integer, and the 64 is 64 bits. Patient race is an object. And then here we have BMI, which is a flute. Also, we can see here the amount of non-null values. So we can see these two, 14 and 15, have very little non-null values. And they are objects. So what we're going to do next is that we want some basic statistics of the training data. So to do that, we will have this describe function here. And basically what that is going to show us is the count, so the number of non-null values in each column, the mean, which is the average of the values in that column, STD, which is the standard deviation of the values in each column, and then the minimum value, which is the minimum value in that, the smallest value in that column. Also, you will see 25%, 15%, 75%. So what that means, that is the quartiles 
of the values in each column. So the 25th, the 25th percentile represents the value below which 25% of the data falls, while same for the 75 percentile represents the value of this 75% of data. The 50%, which is the median, is the middle value of the data set, where half of the data falls below and half above it, indicating the central tendency. And max is the largest number in that column. So here, I will just run the describe function on my train data. And here at the bottom, if you scroll down, you would actually see this is eight rows, 70 columns. So the eight rows is just a count, mean, minimum, but you will see 70 columns. So when we had imported our data, we would have seen 83. So some of those columns would have been um, not numerical. So basically it just shows you the numerical columns. So from the, looking at this, let's look at patient age, which is right here. So you can see the count and then you can see the min, but you will also see the smallest value, which is 19, which means 19 years old. So that's the youngest person that is in this data. Then you will have the oldest person, which is 91. So that is the range of people that were considered for this data set. So then if you just want to display your numerical columns, you can use this command here. And what it does, it selects the types that include a numerical value. So once that is run, we will see all of the columns that have values that are numerical. So we can just... Just, just jump in in one second. Does anybody have any questions so far? If you have any questions, feel free to, to stop Malini and let her know, right? Okay. Malini, you can go ahead. Okay. So, right. This is just all of our columns with numbers. So here is just a little recap. So while you have your notebook and everything in it, you could add some text to just remind you of, you know, your numerical columns, which is continuous and which is discrete and just to point that out. So then we will only want to display our categorical columns. And to do this, you would see previously what we would have passed was NP number. Over here, we would just include object. And once that is run, we will see all of our columns that has characters in them, or in some cases, characters and numbers. So at the bottom here, you would see your 13 columns. And for the previous one, you would see your 70 columns. So that adds up to the 83 columns. And here is just a little reminder about categorical data. So data types are important. It's important to look at your data and see what you have. The reason for that is, so regression is a machine learning algorithm, and this only uses numerical data. But if you have some categories, like we would take a pair type, for instance. So earlier when we would have looked at Google Sheets, we saw there were three categories. So basically what you can do here is that for commercial, you can let one represent that, two represent Medicare Advantage, three represent commercial. So we can do that and you would still be able to run a regression on that data. So it's just some transformation you would have to do. So another thing is that in your data set, you can have duplicate rules. So to do that, and if you have duplicate rules, you could also drop them. So dropping duplicates in data set is a way of cleaning it and ensuring that the data integrity and remove redundancy. So here I have the name of my 
the data frame. And then I use the function drop duplicates. And if it's true, I want to drop it. So what I would do is that just to see the shape after I drop it, that means the number of rows and columns. I'm seeing a question here. So NP number, I'm just going to scroll up here, is because I just want the columns that are numeric. I saw Vidish would have responded. So I hope you understand. If you don't, you can just put on your mic or respond in the chat. Okay, I thanks Vidish. So back to where we were. So if I run the shape function, I would see that the data set actually has no duplicate rules, which is good. But then again, there's a lot of missing values. So missing values and knowing the amount of missing values in a data set is crucial for assessing data quality, guiding pre-processing decisions, ensuring the model performance, preserving statistical validity, optimizing resource allocation, and maintaining transparency in data reporting and analysts. So here is how we're going to find our missing, amount of missing data in each column. So I would use the variable name missing values. And what I'm going to do is train data where it is null. I'm going to add the sum of it. So if all of the rows in that column, once it's null, it adds it. So it counts it like one, two, three, and whatnot. And then I want to print the columns and how much missing data. So here we would have that. And you can see some columns are actually missing quite a lot. So over here, we would see the number of rows and columns. And this here, we would see the number of missing values. And we can see this; these two here are quite high. Now, since they are so high, it will be better to just drop these columns. Because if you keep them and you just use like a mean mode, median, it doesn't make sense. So it will be better to just drop them. So these is just three I'm missing in these columns. So this brings us to the end of this notebook. And as well as one of our mentors, Nicholas Smith, will have contributed to this notebook as well. So thank you, Nicholas. So this is the end of Python. So next, we are going to talk about R. So R is cherished for its robust statistical capabilities, extensive libraries, and vibrant community. R is an open source programming language and software environment designed for statistical computing and graphics. It is widely embraced in academia and industry. R empowers data scientists, statisticians, and analysts to explore, analyze, and visualize data in a comprehensive and customizable manner. So some popular choices of IDEs include R, R Studio, and also Google Collab can be used. Next, we are going to look at some advantages of R. So R, the strengths of R lies is in, in its extensive collaboration of package, collection of package. 
packages such as ggplot2 for data visualization and carta for machine learning exemplify the diverse toolkits available for users. Our interfaces with big data technologies like Apache Spark and Hadoop allowing data scientists to analyze and visualize large data sets without compromising performance. Ours is an open source nature that encourages users to contribute to its development. This philosophy ensures that the language evolves in response to emerging trends and challenges in data science. Ours flexibility allows users to adapt to its diverse tasks and analysis. Its extendability permits the development of custom functions and packages tailored to certain needs. R has a strong presence in research and academia as well. Many statistical and research oriented publications use R for the analysis, contributing to its credibility in the, in the scientific communities. R is compatible with multiple operating systems, including Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, making it accessible to a broader audience. So some disadvantages of R. R is primarily designed for statistical analysis and may be less versatile for general purpose programming tasks or applications outside of statistical domain. Python, for example, is more considered versatile for a broader range of tasks. Our graphical user interface may be less user-friendly and feature-rich compared to some other tools. While RStudio is a popular ID for R, users may find GUI-based tools and other languages more intuitive. While R is widely used in academia and certain industries, its adaptation may be less permanent in sectors well, where other languages like Python are more prevalent. This can affect collaboration and compatibility in certain professional environments. While R has a rich ecosystem of packages for statistical analysts, machine learning, and data visualization, it may have fewer libraries for non-statistical tasks compared to languages in Python. So now we're just going to do a short demo of R. So I will have my script open. So what you do, you open up R. There is a installation guide in the resources. And I believe Dr. Addison and my colleagues will link it here as well on how to download R for the different um, OS that you may have, whether Windows or Mac. So here I'm going to open my, my R script. So if you want, you can create a new script or you could open your script. So I'm going to open my script. And it is in my desktop. So this is how it would appear. So I like my editor file and my console file tiled vertically. So in R, there's your R script, that is the script here. And then there's your R console, which is on your right hand side. So your R script will contain your R code and it will be saved using the .R extension. We can see that this file here will save with the .R extension. And this file was shared with you and it could be shared with others. So the R console that is on your right is where you can directly type your R commands or run code from your R script and it will show immediate results. It also shows your errors as well. To run your code from your R file on the R console, you can place your cursor. So here we have one, of, one line of code. And basically what you do, you just place your cursor at the top of the line, which is on the left, the beginning. 
and then you can click edit at the top and click run line or selection. Also, you can just click control R. If you want to obtain previous code that was run before in your console, you basically can just click your up and down arrows on your keyboard. And then you just click on, sorry, press on enter to run that code. So for single line comments in R, you can use the hash symbol. Everything after the hash symbol on that same line is considered a comment. If you want to add multiple line comments, what you would do is just put this slash asterisk, and then you will put your comment and then end it with the asterisk slash symbol. So in R, we have packages. So installing packages in R is essential for extending its functionality, accessing specialized algorithms and methods, enhancing data visualization and staying up to date with the latest trends and advancements in data analysis and statistical modeling. So one of the packages that I'm going to run is tidyWiz. So I would just copy that and click Control R. So if you run it for the first time, you would see this come up. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to select the first option and click OK. So here as well, you can see that it's telling you where it's downloaded. So Tidyverse is basically it entails ggplot2 that helps you with your graphs. And it have other functionality and packages as well. So first, we're going to discuss how to create a variable and the naming conventions in R. So basically, it's very similar. In R, it, your variables can consist of letters, numbers, underscores, and periods. It must start with a letter, either uppercase or lowercase. Variable names are case sensitive. Also, variables cannot be the same as reserved keywords or functions of R. And also, we have our best practices, which is use descriptive names that reflect the purpose or content of the variable. Avoid using special characters or symbols in the variable names, except for underscores and periods. You can use lowercase letters for variable names to improve the readability and consistency. So here you would notice that you, there's two ways you can store numbers or even um, characters to a variable. So the first way here, we have an arrow and then a dash. And at the bottom here, we have the equal sign. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to run this first two. And in my command line, I would see that the code appears and then the results appear. So it's 18, that's correct. And the equal sign as well does the same thing. So either way, I prefer the first way. And we are going to use the same university edition data set. And in this data set, we're going to use the train data set file because that is where we're going to have a look at our data, clean our data phase, and analyze it and develop our machine learning model. Hi, Malini. So Sorry to interrupt you one second. Is it possible for you to make this a little larger so they can see? Um, let me see. Oh, it's too small. It's a little small, but if not, that's okay. We have the script that we shared with you all in the resources. Yeah, I'm not okay, maybe you could check check GUI preferences when you click on edit and see if you can increase the font size there to about fourteen. See, right, 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 right. Um, yes, uh, right. I think it's on ten. I usually have to do this in my classes as well because I know the students tell me it's looking a little small. So I said, let me see. Let uh -oh. me know if you're... Yes, is it better? Yeah? 
I know the script file, you wouldn't be able to see it um, as much on the console, but you can manipulate it on the script file. Okay, so that's yeah, just a little tip is... for any of you. Right? So you can see it larger there. Okay, great. Okay, sorry about that. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Hide this here at the bottom. Oh, no, that's fine. Thanks. No problem. Right. So now that we have learned about variables, what we're going to do, we're going to import our data. So now when your working directory is, is important because you have to make sure your working directory is correct in order to access your files. So if you want to view your working directory, you just run this line of code, get wd. So you can actually see that mine is my PC in my documents, but my file is saved on my desktop. To change it, I'm going to use set wd. And now it's set to my desktop. So in R as well, we have data frame that is used to save our tabular data in the form of rows and columns. My data frame is going to be train data because I'm using the train data set. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to read that file. And in the parentheses here, I'm going to pass the name of that file, which is train.csv. So I'm just going to highlight and run. And you can see in the console that it was run. So again, you want to make sure your entire data set is imp imported. So control R and here I would see all of my columns. So moving on, it doesn't really tell you how many rows and columns. So what you would want to do is run DIM and in the brackets, put the name of your data frame. And here we can see that all of the rows and all of the columns was imported. So in R, there's numeric data types. You have integers that are positive and negative whole values. And then you have your numbers that are integers and decimal values, as well as you have characters that represent a string of characters such as name, labels, and textual description. As well, you have logical data types and it's used to store binary values such as true and false. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this command to show the name of my columns. And then what I'm going to do is run s apply to see the data types of each column. So yeah, in my console, you could see patient IDs, integer, patient state is character, patient gender is logical. Also, if you would have had an in-depth look at patient gender, you would see that it only has F. So that's what they mean by logical. And as well as it can be male as well. So it's either male or female. So here I would want to run SDR train data. And this is more a readable version of what we would have just done. So it tells you the column name, it tells you the data type, and it gives you a little preview of the data. So it's more readable than the top here. And it also tells you the number of observations, rules, and easy tree variables. So we have our num, we have our characters, we have our integers, and we have our logical data type. So the next thing we want to look at is the count of missing values in this data set. So we are going to run the next two lines of code. And what this tells you is true or false. So this tells you how much missing data you have and how much data you have. So the true is the count of the missing values and the false is the number of non-missing values. So when you have a look here, it looks 
pretty small compared to the number of forks. So next we will want to look at a summary of our train data. So yeah, let's scroll up a bit. And what this will tell you is the smallest value. So let's take um let's take BMI for instance. So your smallest value is 14. Then you have your first quartile, which represents the median of the lower half of the data set. Then you have the median, then you have your mean, and then you have your third quartile, which is the median of the upper half of the data set. Then you have your maximum value, and then you have the amount of missing values, which is your NEs. So you can see that this comes up for your numerical columns, but for your categorical, um, columns with characters, it just shows you the class and mode, which is characters. So this just gives you an insight of how your data is spread from the smallest to the biggest. And this brings us to the end of this notebook. Does anybody have any questions? I am seeing a comment in the chat. Yeah, so just looking at the data, how it's imported, you can see the outliers. So that is a great observation. So I had previously mentioned this, um, especially for MATLAB. So you can combine your tools. So right now, I believe there was a recent demonstration of how MATLAB can be incorporated with R. Sometimes people like to import their data in Microsoft Excel first or Google Sheets and then use R or Python to further analyze data. So you could use a combination of tools that just harnesses the strength of all the platforms so you would be able to better analyze your data. So I just want to hear your thoughts. So those of you who might be beginners or pros, which data science tools do you prefer? So I would go with this. Um, I like Python. It's one of my favorites. Because I like how you know you could have your text displayed in a certain way, and it definitely just it's kind of you could see the difference between the text and the code. So any of you all would like to share your views or what you all are going to try for the data turn if it is you might start off with Google Sheets or R or Python. Yes, let us know in the chat and any tools that you actually are accustomed to using. Either way, you could let us know as well, because I know we have a mixed audience. So as Malini started off, um, I use a mix of many tools. My go-to would be R. I also use SPSS. And I am still a very big fan of Microsoft Excel for certain things. And of course, you realize that you could bring Microsoft Excel into, as she mentioned, you could import these documents into the larger tools as well. So anybody else in the chat, any tools that you prefer? I know some beginners here might have um, not used some, but I see there is someone said in the chat, Anthony said he uses the, the, the site of Learn Library with resources. Oh, oh, sorry, Malady, he has a question for you. I know that site at Learn Library has online resources to assist with further understanding. Is there something similar for R? The CRAN environment is okay. But are there other recommended resources for R in particular? Um, I'm not uh, sure. Um, I don't know, Vidish, if you want to chime in here. I could assist 
with this part in terms of Anthony, I just wanted to know. So, for instance, in CRAN, the CRAN network, for those of you who may not be aware, that's a comprehensive R archive network. There are a number of libraries and packages there. So what happens is you have some base packages there. They would have had some of the prisons would have created over time. But there are also updated packages that are usually sometimes floating around. Like, for instance, most recently, somebody might have created one for bioinformatics. And they may have something like that there. I don't know if, if it's uploaded into the CRAN network, if that's what your question is. But there are a lot of extra packages and libraries that people create. Um, so if that's what you're asking, then I would say, aside from CRAN, sometimes you could check the forums as well. My only thing with checking forums is sometimes I'm not certain, you know, if usually it's more legitimate when you go to the CRAN network. Um, sometimes, you know, if it has, I don't know, have viruses and those things, if you're downloading the the actual package that way. Um, but yes, the validity, yes, yeah. So um, I would always start with the CRAN network first. And of course, you could feel free, whatever level you are, to actually write your own package. Um, I've seen PhD students who have written packages as part of their PhD um, using R. So if any of the, you are in here and considering such, that's an opportunity for you, depending on how unique it is based on whatever work you're doing as well. So I hope that answers your question, Anthony. And if not, we can always, um, yeah, sure. We can always link you some further resources. That's a good question. Any other questions for Malini on any of the tools? Okay. So, I mean, any of you have any other questions? And in the meantime, we can launch um, a poll. Sorry, go ahead, Malini. Yeah, you can go ahead. Um, if you all have any questions later on, you all can always reach out to me and I will be happy to assist. So this actually brings me to the end of my presentation and I would like to thank all of you for attending today's workshop. I hope it has been insightful and your presence was greatly appreciated. And I would like to especially thank Dr. Addison and Nicholas and Videsh and Priya as well for assisting. So now I will hand you over to Dr. Addison. Thank you so much, Malini. Um, I mean, so insightful and you packed so much information in that short space of time in a really bite-sized way for beginners to understand as well. I have picked up a lot of things I did not even know also in some of these tools. So I feel like that was very, very insightful. Does anybody have any questions or any comments about it? I have a temperature check about how questions feel. Um, and just to let you know, no level of intimida intimidation or judgment if it is that you feel like the tools aren't um, things that you understand yet fully, even in terms of Python. And Python has its own language, as I like to say, it's almost like learning a new language. R as well. For persons who are more in, um, involved in like social sciences, you might be more accustomed to things like SPSS, where it's like a nice point and click interface like Excel and those things. So no judgment, depending on how you feel about the tools, but we really want to know you know, do you um, appreciate the tools? Is it something that looks intimidating? Is it something that looks resourceful um, that can help you in your own um, whatever sphere that you're in? Because remember, in data science is not limited to just the STEM fields as sometimes we think, you know, business and all of these other fields would use a lot of data science insights and therefore have specific tools to use. Um, so I still want to invite any questions or any comments. Um, thank you so much, Malini, for the the talk, um, Malini is doing some great work as well in her master's, as she told you initially, and she continues to do so. So you all can always connect with Malini on LinkedIn. And um, I would at this point like to share with you all the results of the poll. Let me just end the poll so I can show you all what, what has been said so far. Let me share the results. Let me know if you're all seeing it on the screen, right? So, so far, how do you feel about data science at the end of the session in terms of the tools? Um, I see we in the middle, 47% of you all in terms of the feelings about, about the tools being easy. No problem. We'll see by the end of the series how you all feel. But as I said, and I always like to say, if you're not uncomfortable, I'd be surprised, right? Um, always um, growth and learning sometimes feels uncomfortable. So I'm happy that you all are here. So I just want to mention, um, I think Abram is asking a question. Let me see in the chat. Um, I'm not seeing. Let me see if I can see the question. Abram is asking. Abram can you tell us? Yes, yes, Abram, go ahead. I'm, yes. I'm asking about the session on February 6th. That's 6.30. I wanted to know a bit more about that session, um, the medium it will take, etc. 
Okay, sure. Let me um let me mention to those of you who actually want to be involved in the data fund, no matter where you are located in the world, if you're interested in some of our sessions, or we'll be having a, like a group session to talk about the data set. We have different teams. So we have a session on Tuesday at 6 30 p.m. AST. You can email us. I'll let Priya drop the Gmail in the um the email address in the chat, widsttgroup at gmail.com. If you're interested in being a part of the data fund and you would like to have like teammates and that sort of thing, or you just want to generally just sit down and talk to us about the data set. We'll have our, some of our mentors in that session. Feel free to join us on Tuesday. So Abram, if you're in a team or even if you're not in a team, we like to do it in a community aspect where we're all talking about what's going on in the data set, how to tackle it in terms of the, the challenge, et cetera. So that session will be like an open team formation session even if you're not in, um, sorry, even if in your team, you can join and we could always just um, have a chat about, you know, how the data is looking, um, even self for beginners, where do you start into the, how do you analyze it? Um, so feel free to reach out if you'd like to join that session. So okay, thank that. you. And so that will yeah. be online as well? That will be online. That's virtual. So once you email us, if okay. you're interested, we'll send you the link for that. All right. Thank you. Um, and then let me just throw in one more thing. Um, I'll just share my screen just to remind you all. For those of you who would like to continue with our session, so of course, you got some really great takeaways today from Malini in terms of using the data science tools for important deductions in your different fields. And of course, the tool depends on the nature of the data. Now, remember that some of them, as she mentioned, may have advantages and disadvantages. You know, some of them have licenses, et cetera. Um, for the data fund challenge, you would find a lot of the times you'll be using Python and R. There's also a crossover with Python and MATLAB, as she mentioned, and also R and MATLAB for those of you who probably use MATLAB under the university license. SPSS for social scientists who use that a lot. There's also a version of it. There are different packages that you could use to involve, um, in terms of data science, but you may find yourself with this type of competition wanting to use um, some of the other tools that we mentioned initially. All the resources are in the folder. So, for you, for those of you who registered, the resources are in the folder, and we will post the recording as well on YouTube. And in the next session in our series, you can feel free to join us on the next workshop next week, where we will have two of our international uh, mentors who will be talking to us about data visualization techniques. How does my data look? And they will go in more in depth. So you see, Malini gave you all the foundation in terms of the basics. And I really, really was very pleased with how she laid that out in a very easy to understand format. So once you look into that, do that as your homework, then you come into our next session, it will be easy for you to follow on in terms of looking at the data now in a visual sense. So for instance, how does the data look overall? Like the Anthony had mentioned, the BMI seems to have an outlier and these types of things. So you have to be intrigued and curious now. So it's going to pique your curiosity now. And you could see our next um, follow-up workshops after that. You all could also register for those one time as well. And thank you so much for joining us. I know this is usually a two-hour session, but we usually complete in 90 minutes. And if you all have any questions, want to discuss anything about our mentors, feel free to let us know. But connect with us on LinkedIn for updates. Um, you can visit our website and also subscribe to our YouTube channel so you could get more information um, on the past recordings and workshops. Um, so. At this point, anybody has any questions and Priya would have put the resources for you in the chat. So any closing questions, anything? Um, hoping to see all, any of you, any data phone already, let us know and um, we can support you in your journey as well. So that's it from me. Um, any closing remarks, Malini, um, for them um, going forward? Sorry, there's a question. Um, no, sorry, it's Nicholas. Um, oh, Nicholas, Anthony yeah. asked if there's a group chat because he may not be able to attend. So you can oh, sorry. tell them about um, Slack. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We also have a Slack channel. So let me advise you all. For those of you, this is very impromptu. So let me just do this from my computer just to show you. When you sign up, if, if we have any international persons here, when you go on the widstt.org page, so I'm just going to, Priya, you could probably link them. That's on the chat. And I'll just share my screen. Any of you who are interested in our sessions, what we do is we have a little bit of a... Um, when you scroll down on the wordct.org page, this is our mailing list. What you could do is sign up here if you haven't before. And once you click on the link, it will bring you to this page with participant mentor speaker interests where you could put in your interests 
based on our team and we automatically put you into a Slack channel, right? Um, for those of you who don't necessarily use Slack, we will still send some email updates. So you can fill out this form if you're interested in getting updates from us, but we'll put you in the Slack channel and we post everything there. We also post on our YouTube, um, I'm sorry, our LinkedIn as well as YouTube. So feel free to connect with us that way and um, and we will have, we'll keep you in your loop, right? So yes, okay, great. Okay, so we have come to the end of the session. Um, so if there are no questions, and I know if you don't have any questions here, you might have otherwise, feel free to connect with us. We have a number of knowledgeable uh, mentors in the chat as well. And um, we shall see you all in the next one. So have a great day, evening, night, wherever you are, and take care.